Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you market by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconin. Dennis Dick is back in the saddle here. And we have Thomas Simpson on the line. He's a former Federal Reserve officer and author of Financial Markets, Banking, and Monetary Policy. Tom, how are you doing this morning? Well, I'm doing great, thank you. Well, you have the honor and distinction of being our first Federal Reserve officer ever on the show. Oh, well, I'm honored. Okay. Could you just tell us, you know, how, I mean, obviously you spent some time in the banking industry. Um, how did you end up as a Federal Reserve officer, and uh, where were you uh, stationed? Okay. Um, well, I'm an economist. Uh, I received a Ph.D. in economics, and the field that uh, was always of interest to me was monetary and macroeconomics. So uh, I kind of naturally became a, a Fed watcher. Uh, I was a professor for a while, and the opportunity came up to uh, be a member of the staff at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C., and I jumped at that opportunity. At first, I wasn't sure whether I would be there very long, but after about a year, I realized that's really where uh, my interests lie. And um, and uh, I was uh, there for quite a few years and uh, found that it was uh, every day was uh, an exciting challenge. And uh, being part of the policy process, being able to do research in this area, do writing in this area to help the policymakers uh, was uh, a thrill each and every day. So it was a, a great experience. Can you jump into just your thoughts on monetary policy? And obviously, we've had a lot of quantitative easing from the Fed here now. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, when we went through the financial crisis and, uh, uh, and, and had to deal with its consequences in terms of throwing the economy into a, a severe recession, uh, the, the Federal Reserve used its standard toolbox of the federal funds rate, lowered the federal funds rate pretty, pretty rapidly through the end of 2008. And um, then it, they got down to the zero point, and it was clear that more needed to be done. So they were thinking outside the box. They, were, they had to come up with uh, new measures that uh, hadn't really been tried in the past and weren't needed in the past. Uh, so uh, the quantitative easing that you referred to is, is a part of that. Also, they came to realize that forward guidance, which is really trying to convey to the markets where they intend to be setting the federal funds rate uh, over the near term, that became an important policy tool as well, as well. So it was more like a commitment on their part to be holding the federal funds rate low with the expectation that that would get translated into lower interest rates across the board. So, I mean, both of those tools, I think, were were appropriate at, at the time and uh, have been an important reason why we haven't been uh, even weaker uh, in terms of the macro economy. Now, we're looking at the stock market, and it's been making new all-time highs and marching up on the back of all this quantitative easing. Now that the quantitative easing has stopped, um, what are your thoughts here? Like, is this something that they're going to have to go back to if the market starts to collapse, or is this something that they're probably done doing now? At this point, I think they're finished. I think that uh, it would take uh, a significant weakening of the economy. Right now, the economy looks like it's poised for moderate growth. And I, I think the, the indicators are fairly solid uh, to suggest that at least for the next several quarters, we should be getting solid but moderate growth. Um, and in those circumstances, going back to quantitative easing won't, uh, would not be called for. So I, I think in terms of the stock market and the bond market as well, the Fed has been, this time around, more so than at any time in the past, 
has been mindful of the need to be very transparent and very clear and to provide guidance to the markets in terms of its intentions so that it doesn't surprise the markets. Because if, if they were to surprise the markets in terms of any tightening measures, then you would get uh, a, a, a significant market reaction. Uh, they don't want that. And at this point, I think the bond market and I think the stock market have have sufficiently priced in this moderate tightening that will take place, the so-called normalization of the federal funds rate, which is likely to take place, start actually in the, the second half of next year. Uh, and it's going to be moderate, at least that's those are the signals they're sending out. So I think to the extent that that's the way things unfold, then I think the market reaction is not going to be fairly substantial. Uh, it, there, there will be. I think when the day comes when they actually raise the federal funds rate, there probably will be a small reaction. But I, I think unlike some episodes in the past, particularly if we go back 20 years in 1994 where there was a, a very – vicious market reaction to the Fed's tightening. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen this time because the Fed learned an awful lot from that experience and realized that uh, it needs to be very clear with the markets in terms of its intentions. Okay, moderate tightening. That is, uh, that's an interesting statement there. Could, yeah. you, uh, could you just delve into that a little bit more? Sure. Um, you know, we're talking about raising the federal funds rate, and the Fed usually does this in increments of 25 basis points, whether it's raising or lowering. It's only unusual circumstances that result in something different. Um, this is uh, likely to happen you know, based on conditions regarding the economy based on the statements that the Fed has made, this is likely to begin, as I mentioned before, in the second half of next year, probably late summer, early fall. And then I think that this time around, at least at first, they are going to be raising the federal funds rate by these 25 basis point increments, I'd say roughly about every three months, every other meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. They have eight meetings per year. And I think they're going to be fairly clear in terms of their language uh, regarding this. If we go back in time, if we go back uh, 10 years ago when the Fed uh, began tightening after the the previous recession uh, and, and, and then the, the, the recovery that was kind of slow in coming, uh, the, the Fed raised the federal funds rate by 25 basis point increments, but they did it each meeting, so eight times per year they did it. I think this time, just given uh, that things uh, that the economy doesn't have the same degree of traction, that they will be uh, more gradual. But that's that's the outlook that I have, and I think that's consistent with what's priced into federal funds futures and, and other asset prices. That was going to be my next question for you was, uh, do you see it actually being priced into the Fed fund futures rates? And uh, and obviously you do. A uh, couple questions here. First of all, when did you start at the Fed? I started in... Uh, 1976. Oh, okay. 19. So you had been there a while because I mean, right. just could you just talk about like the financial crisis? It was uh, it was uh, during the time of transition uh, in the you know in the White House. The world was coming uh, you know apart. Major banks were crumbling. I mean, you know, Bernanke obviously they navigated us out of this. But can you just I mean, going to work every day in the mood? I mean, could you just could you just talk about that, or do you talk about that? Yeah. Well, know? actually, I was not there at the time. I had left um, uh, about a year and a half before it uh, it, it got it to the worst. Uh, so I, I can only uh, imagine I was following things very closely. Uh, so I, you know, I think I knew what was going on. I was told uh, by uh, the board's barber, who I, I visit from time to time still, uh, that uh, <laughs> when he would come in in the morning, early in the morning, uh, he would see pizza boxes lined up uh, in the hallways because folks had been working all night, and I can fully imagine what that was like. I know when I would 
have an opportunity to to see former colleagues. Uh, I could tell that you know they they had red eyes and uh, they looked like they were uh, had been worked pretty hard. So I know it was really a, a, a tough time uh, and and one where the adrenaline was was flowing almost 24 hours a day. But uh, you know in those. I'm sure that during that particular period, uh, Chairman Bernanke was asking for ideas in terms of what do we do here because we've never, you know, we've we've got a situation that we uh, we have to be thinking outside the box in terms of uh, addressing it. And I think they came up with some pretty clever ideas that avoided uh, an even worse outcome. Okay, the whole pace of the tapering and this whole scenario. Uh, that the Fed has created is predicated on low inflation. Now, oil is definitely moving in that direction. Uh, even though gold has had a recent rally, uh, you know, there's really the gold market is not telling you there's any kind of rampant inflation. What, I mean, what what's your outlook on that? Because if we start to get, you know, some, some inflation creeping into the, to the economy, is it just really going to throw the, you know, the pace of the tapering off? Uh, I, I think the inflation outlook at this point is, is rather benign. Uh, in fact, it may be too benign for at least for the Fed's taste. Uh, we've, uh, we have inflation on the order of 1.5%. They have announced that they have a goal or a target of 2%. And uh, if we look at the factors that are likely to be driving inflation over the next uh, oh, year or so, We've got the stronger dollar, and that's going to pass through uh, in various ways in terms of holding down inflation over this period. And then, as you've noted, oil prices I and mean, even core measures of, of inflation, which exclude uh, food and energy prices, even those will be held down by this because of indirect effects. So that's, I think, if anything is going to be causing – both those factors are going to be causing inflation to be lower – uh, we still have slack in the economy. Uh, it, the unemployment rate is 5.8 percent, which is getting, as, as we measure things, uh, kind of close to what we normally regard as full employment. But we know that that's not a reliable, reliable indicator at this point, that there are a lot of people who are working part time. Uh, who would want to be working full time, so there's slack in that regard. And there's also an awful lot of uh, people who are not even regarding themselves in the labor force. They're not participating in the labor force, at least according to the statistics. And, and this is many of those for economic reasons. And when the expansion improves, then uh, they'll be coming out of the woodwork to, to join the labor force. But what I'm trying to say is there still is slack in the economy. And when there's slack in the economy, that will tend to put downward pressure on, on the inflation rate. So I think there are a number of factors that are holding down and will continue to hold down inflation. Of course, you know, if inflation started picking up, and particularly if this ignited inflation expectations, if individuals and businesses started to think that maybe inflation was going to be higher, then there would be a serious problem. The, the Fed would be behind the eight ball in terms of having to address that at a time when I'm sure they would be concerned about measure the impact of tightening measures on uh, on the recovery on the economic expansion so I, I think there would uh, that would be a very difficult situation but I think the chances of that are at this point I would say are, are fairly low so you're not that concerned with the inflation because you think with all the quantitative easing that we've had that eventually yeah. there could be some inflation here and not only that what what do they really do if if, if that scenario did come out and we do start to see inflation they can't really start raising interest rates that easy for risk of hurting the economy, right? Right. I mean, that, that's, that would be the dilemma. Uh, you know, they have the, uh, the dual mandate, which is stable prices, which, as I noted, uh, they translate into 2% increase in, in measured prices. 
uh, they've got that, and then they've got maximum employment. And so here they would have to make a, a decision in terms of which is going to get the higher weight in terms of policy action. They have indicated that in those circumstances they would have uh, a measured approach. And I think what they mean by this is that they would take uh, moderate steps towards trying to restrain inflation, but not so aggressive as to derail the economic expansion. We're on the line with Tom Simpson, former Federal Reserve officer and author of the Financial Markets, Banking, and Monetary Policy. Thomas, before we let you go, could you tell us about our about your book? Okay, uh, I'd be delighted to. Uh, I just recently uh, published this book. John Wiley and Sons uh, is my publisher. It is a book that uh, is intended to provide a wide audience, uh, an understanding of how financial markets are organized, how they work together, and what the role is of monetary policy. There's a a big interconnection between monetary policy and the performance of financial markets and the financial system. Uh, Also, in terms of the conduct of monetary policy, it works through those markets, it works through financial institutions. And it was my intention, based on my experience at the Fed and my understanding of the underlying economics, to put together a nice, coherent uh, package uh, that would be of assistance in terms of helping people better understand this whole thing. I think it's very current. The kinds of issues we've been talking about are, are covered in, in the textbook, uh, along with a lot of other things. Okay, Thomas Simpson, former Federal Reserve officer, joining us today on Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Thank you very much and very informative, and uh, we look forward to having you on again. Well, very, very, very good. I've enjoyed this very much. Uh, I'd love to talk about this, so anytime uh, you want to pursue these issues further, uh, I'll have to be happy to try to accommodate. I'm sure we will, because the Fed is not going anywhere. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and have a good day. You too. Bye. Thanks, Thomas.